and I thought it'd be easier if I did this as a video presentation rather than just walk you through it in a Google Meet. And so all I'd like to do with this PowerPoint is to give you some structure chronologically about Roman history, because you've had a lot of the themes uh, brought to you by Mary Beard in the four-part documentary series we've watched up to this point. But I want to try just a couple minutes to bring this all together into a larger whole. On this front page, I've put some notable Romans, Pompey the Great on the left, Lucius, Junius, Brutus, and look how he stares creepily at you, uh, and Augustus, the first Roman emperor on the right. So the major periods of Roman history, the city was founded around 753 BC. There were seven kings. Most of them were probably mythical. The last three might have been historical. After the monarchy ended in 509 BC and was replaced by what we call the Roman Republic, which lasted until about 31 BC, where it transitions into what we call the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire has two sort of end dates. It ends in Western Europe much earlier in 476 AD, and after that we start to talk about the very early Middle Ages, the rise of different Germanic kingdoms like, you know, the Germans, the Franks, and so forth. But in the East, what we sometimes call the Byzantine Empire, because they were speaking Greek, not Latin, that lasts until 1453, when it's finally uh, conquered by the Ottoman Sultan Mehmed II. I think we've talked about this before, but just in case, because we're going to focus mostly on the Republic today, power is shared in the Republic between the Senate, sort of the elite Roman males, and the people as a whole, although that's only with men. The cursus honorum are the different ranks and offices that a young aristocrat would try to climb through, which includes membership in the Senate, culminating on the counselor. Sometimes you get to go on to be censor, but because that's only once every five years, that's obviously the hardest one to try to get. And of course, we want to remember the larger context of Rome in the Mediterranean. This is the Roman Empire at its largest extent. So you're going all the way well into Mesopotamia, kind of parts of Iraq and Iran, although Rome gave those back in 118. AD, this is 117. But this is the largest extent that it spreads its power and influence and culture. More Latin in the West, more Greek in the East, uh, over the course of several hundred years. And I've brought up Greek, the language, a number of times, but it's always worthwhile to remember that even before there was Rome, there were Greeks in Italy. They had colonized most of southern Italy over the 7th to 5th centuries BC, starting with this little island you can see by Kumi called Ischia. A great deal of Greek pottery has been found in dis and is displayed in different museums in Italy. Much of it was found in Italy. And in fact, the best preserved Greek temples aren't in Greece itself, but they're in southern Italy in places like Pestum or Posidonia uh, and in Sicily. So the monarchy, which I'm just going to really skip over, because as I said, most of the kings are mythical. The Romans think they add different things. Romulus obviously founds the city. Numa, the second king, really adds on to Roman religion. But as you get to the end, the seventh king, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, which just means Lucius Tarquin the jerk, he comes to power by nefarious means. He kills the previous king, his father-in-law, and he is a cruel tyrant. His sons are also jerks. One of them rapes Lucretia, who was the wife of his cousin, as you can tell by the name, Lucius Tarquinius Collatinus. Lucretia, as the story goes, exhorts her husband, her father, and Lucius Junius Brutus, and you might remember him by the man who's staring at you and judging you in the center here right now. She gets them to take revenge, and so they drive out the Tarquins and... Uh, there's a revolution now, there is a new form of government. It is weird, well not weird, unsettling might be the better word, that the Romans 
when they have political crises, the beginning of the Republic, and then the so-called um, group of ten men that both gives them the basic Roman constitution, but also has a very similar story where um, uh, one of the tyrannical members of the Board of Ten tries to rape uh, someone's fiance, and then she ultimately dies and they overthrow these tyrants. Now, we're going to just kind of, again, really fast forward ahead from the beginnings of the Republic to the end of it, uh, both because the end of it has more historical sources so we can say a lot more about it, and also because even the stuff that we can say about the early Republic, about the kings, and about the Punic Wars are all also mostly written at the end, and they reflect a lot of the problems like civil war, that were happening at the end of the Republic. So this map, even though it goes well into the Empire, does give you a good summary of how Rome expanded, starting with the blue parts. So first they take over all of Italy, then they get Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, over the course of the Punic Wars fought with Carthage, that's in that uh, number eight there in modern-day Libya. And they begin to expand more and more, and then into the Greek world, then into Asia Minor, up into Spain, into Gaul, into Illyria, or modern-day Yugoslavia, and then ultimately into Egypt. And that gets us to the beginning of the empire. It doesn't expand too much more after that. Augustus is much more interested <coughs> excuse me, in maintaining what they had. This is partly because you can see up in Germany, 1 BC to AD 9, the Germans wiped out a massive Roman army in AD 9. And at that point, Augustus thought, well, let's just keep what we have. But before we fully jump ahead to the end, I need to talk about a really important part of how Roman culture and Roman politics work, both because it explains a great deal of Roman history and it's an important reason about why the Republic collapsed. And that is aristocratic competition. And the basic way we can define it is that every elite Roman male wants to be sumus optimus maximus. First, best, and greatest. Another way to put it is that after they drive out the kings, rex, our Latin word for king, is a dirty word at Rome. Because you know, kings are now in bad odor after the tyranny of Tarquin the Proud and his sons. But the other reason it's such a dirty word is that deep down inside, every Roman aristocrat wants to be rex, sumus optimus maximus. This is also one reason why Roman political offices, like the consulate or praetors, who have the most power and can command armies, only last for a year. And it's exceedingly rare for someone to repeat offices, that usually only happens in a crisis like the war with Hannibal or when the Germans were about to invade uh, Italy in the late second century. And in fact, there are laws passed that you have to wait, say, 10 years before you can even run for the consulate again. So it's important in this system that people get that sumus kind of power, but that it is open to as many people as possible. Because if it wasn't, then eventually one person or one family just takes control of everything and you get to the Roman Empire. Now, of course, that's ultimately what actually happened. So it's kind of amazing that this system lasted for nearly 500 years. The best way to symbolize that achievement of Sumus Optimus Maximus is that you celebrate a triumph, this big parade and party that you would get if you defeat or have a, a great enough victory in war. You are painted red, you can't quite see because I took this shot from behind Caesar from HBO's Rome, which is also what the statue in the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, shown here, had on his face. In other words, the Roman general is now like the god. You are god for a day, but just a day. Well, you can say, I'm better than everybody. So triumphs are very hard to get because you only get them, you have to ask the Senate, as in your peers, for one. And so they have an interest in not handing out too many of these because, of course, they also all secretly want it. And if everybody gets a triumph, that kind of devalues it. 
So, why does the republic fall? It's a process that takes several decades, and I said aristocratic competition is one problem with it. Another major issue is wealth inequality. And not just, I'm not just trying to draw analogies to today, the problem was it leads to manpower issues in the army, and that's because wealth is primarily based upon land ownership. And participation in the Roman army is dependent on land ownership. So as wealth in the form of land becomes more and more concentrated in the hands of fewer people who then use slaves who are not liable to military service unless it's an emergency like Hannibal, then that's that much less that the Romans can draw on for their army. In turn, that means they need to rely on people like the Italian allies to do a lot of the fighting for them. But then the Italian allies begin to realize that they're doing a lot of, if not most, of the work, and they're getting very little rewards. They don't even have Roman citizenship. So then they start to rebel, what's called the social war, until the Romans finally defeat them and then also give them citizenship. So the army is becoming a big problem here. When the Romans would conquer new territory, they would divide up some land for small farmers, but keep other land undistributed because it wasn't ready for agriculture, and they would just charge rent to anyone who decided to use it. The rich took over more and more land by offering more money to the treasury in the form of rent than your average small farmer could. Because uh, large plantation farms uh, called latifundia, or the, rather they began large plantation farms called latifundia, and here's a picture of an example, example of one, with this land as well as other land that they took. Now this drives more and more rural poor into the city where they become the urban poor, and they get some limited welfare like a grain dole, which eventually expands to even pork and wine and olive oil into the empire, but they can't serve in the Roman army now because they don't have any land. It's been taken away from them. So, it finally gets to a point where Rome, with all the wars it has going on, because they're fighting a war every year, they finally solve the manpower issue, specifically Gaius Marius, who's the guy on the top left, by opening up the army to all volunteers, which basically means the urban poor. And he promises them a hefty retirement package, land, if they complete a term of service, and obviously if they survive. What this really means is that now the soldiers are dependent upon the general to get their rewards instead of the Senate or the state. So their loyalty moves less from Rome and more towards whoever their general is. And so this leads to a series of military dynasts or warlords. Marius, and then the really ugly, angry-looking guy, Sulla, and then on the top right, Pompey, on the bottom left, Julius Caesar. I didn't put in a picture here of Mark Antony. We'll see him later. But Octavian, Caesar's heir, uh, they're on the bottom right. They all use their armies as a power base. At first, it's just to wield influence. But by the time you get to Caesar and Octavian, and then the later Roman emperors, they've used it to take over the state completely. So the first stage of this is what we call the first triumvirate. And it's got these three guys. There's Caesar, and there's Pompey, and the guy you haven't seen before who looks kind of constipated is Marcus Licinius Crassus, who, had, who was the richest of the three. When these three guys came together, they each had different needs, and each had something that they could offer to the others. Crassus, he wanted to be important again, and he had a lot of money and influence because of that money. Pompey, who was a great military leader, but not a great politician, he needs some political success, which in the past only came with Crassus, and he needs to take care of his soldiers to give them the land that he promised them. So he has the military reputation and the influence with the soldiers, which, remember, is very important now. Caesar wants to be consul because it's his year to do it, and he wants a big military command so he can have an army to have that kind of influence. He also has the chief priesthood in Rome. He's a great speaker, and... He is the best politician of the three. So they overcome this, uh, all their rivalries, uh, because Crassus and Pompey really hated each other. 
Caesar gets his consulate, Pompey's soldiers get their land, Crassus gets his influence back, and one way they seal the deal is that Caesar's daughter, Julia, marries Pompey. I have a pet theory that her original fiancé was the Brutus who ends up killing Caesar, because at the time he was known as Quintus Capio, and we are told that Julia's original fiancé was a Capio. And what made it sting even more for Brutus, if I'm right, is that Pompey had killed his father. See, I told you, this is the best attested period of Roman history, so we can get some real detail of you know, why people might have really hated each other. Why did Cato really hate Julius Caesar? One reason was that Caesar was having an affair with Cato's sister, who was also Brutus' mother. Ultimately, all these ties break down because Crassus dies in Cari in Syria, and then Julia, uh, Pompey's wife, also died in childbirth. And whatever else might be said about Pompey, um, he really did love Julia. So, Pompey and Caesar now go at it. And to a lot of people, it seems like Sulla and Marius, who fought a civil war all over again, partly because Caesar is Marius' nephew, and Pompey first came to prominence fighting for Sulla. Caesar wanted to be number one. His dignitas, his self-worth, mattered above all else. Pompey also wanted to be number one. He kind of already was, and he definitely did not want to give that up or even share it. Crassus also wanted to be number one, to have equal dignitas to Pompey and Caesar, which is why he tried to invade Parthia and died there. Caesar ultimately wins the civil war against Pompey. He comes and starts to take a lot of constitutional reforms, starts these massive monumental projects, many of which Augustus finishes. At one point, he thought he was going to try to finish what Crassus uh, started and invade and defeat Parthia, and he was, in fact, assassinated a few days before he left. He was going to leave for that. The Senate votes him increasingly madcap honors, dictator for life. Maybe we'll worship you as a god. We'll call this month Quintilus July, which we still do today. Caesar changed the calendar in more ways than one, which you remember from uh, the Mary Beard video. And he also broke aristocratic competition by kind of getting rid of the competition and just picking all the winners himself in advance. And this, in fact, was a huge reason for his assassination, which you can see uh, pictured here on, on the right. His heir, his great-nephew, is this guy named Octavian. Funnily enough, uh, Marcus Brutus was the heir if Octavian had died, which was a possibility. He was a very sickly boy. He's looked down upon initially by Mark Antony, who points out accurately that Octavian, as a, adopted by Caesar, just owes everything to his name, because when he's adopted, he becomes Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus. We call him Octavian to uh, make it simpler to distinguish him from his uncle. Um, and the other reason Antony had looked down upon him was that when there was a power vacuum after Caesar's murder, Antony was counsel that year, Caesar had picked him, uh, and he stepped in to fill that power vacuum. Other Republicans, like Cicero, try to manipulate Octavian to oppose Antony, but since Octavian is smart enough to realize, and Cicero was stupid enough to say that once they get rid of Antony, they're going to get rid of Octavian too, Octavian changes sides. He allies with Antony, they form the Second Triumvirate, and they turn on the other Republicans and begin a purge, which leads to, among others, Cicero's death. So the Second Triumvirate is Mark Antony, and there he is right now, Caesar's right-hand man, Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus, his heir, Caesar's heir, and this guy Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, who was at best a political opportunist, and for the other two, they needed a third guy, because you need three for a triumvirate. So the first triumvirate is just an unofficial pact between Crassus, Caesar, and Pompey. The second triumvirate was officially appointed by the Senate to restore the state. But like the first triumvirate, their thirst for power broke this alliance apart. Octavian exiles Lepidus first when Lepidus tries to make a play and then realizes that his own soldiers are more loyal to Octavian than they are to him. And then he defeats Mark Antony in battle at Actium and then at Alexandria. Um, you know, that's the part of the story that brings in Cleopatra. But I think we've kind of talked uh, just about enough for today. And I hope I've given you a basic structure of Roman history. And one reason, of course, I did it this way is that as a video, 
you can pause whenever you want. And so you don't just have to listen to me ramble on for however long it's been. I hope you guys are staying healthy and staying safe. And it's good to see you guys again uh, in our meetings. And I hope to uh, see you guys soon in person at some point. We'll see. But I hope, nevertheless, you guys are staying healthy out there. Have a great weekend.